Hi. In this session, we're going to talk about the output tab in Synergy MultiViewer. We're going to show you how we can print the results on the screen, but also how we can engage IP outputs and multiple IP outputs so that we can stream things out to broadcast screens like this or even to mobile devices. So what I'm going to do is use the same machine we've been using in other sessions and the settings we've already built up to add things to the output tab. So if we turn down to this machine here, here's the MultiViewer we installed previously, back running in mosaic mode, and we can see the output settings are set with just a standard single window output enabled. You can see underneath it, a single RTP output is added but grayed. The first thing we're going to do is go to this RTP output, enable it, and configure it. So if we tick the enabled box, all of these entry elements should light up. And we've got some defaults I've pre-configured in here before. So the first thing we've got in here is broadcast mode. It gives us a choice of unicast or multicast. We'd recommend multicast. This means we can put the information on the network once, and the network will take care of distributing that to all the different clients that want it. If we chose unicast, we'd have to add one RTP output for every device we wanted to send it to, and that very quickly wears out the multiviewer box itself. So let's leave it on multicast here because we have that set up. Our second choice is how we want to stream it, whether we want to stream as plain UDP packets or choose RTP packets. By default, you should always choose RTP packets unless you have a good reason not to. It adds an extra bit of stability to the system and makes it much easier for network administrators to understand what's going on. So we're going to pick these two defaults. The second part is an important part to choose right. This is the IP and port we're going to publish this multicast as. If you don't understand what this means, I'd recommend spending a little bit of time to look on the internet and understand the basics of multicast. What we do here is we follow a convention where we always use 239, a local multicast address, mixed with some elements taken from the IP address assigned to the adapter we want to use. So if we look down here, we can choose what multicast network cards we want to actually broadcast on. I only want to broadcast on one network adapter here, so I have filled out just my primary source IP. In a high availability scenario, I would probably want to broadcast onto two networks and therefore would want to use two network cards in which case I can describe two different IP addresses in here, one for the primary network card, one for the secondary. However, we're just sending out a one network card here, so I can just fill in one. This means this is going to make sure all the multicast traffic goes out on my dedicated video network, rather than coming out on the office network here that has the internet and file sharing on. The other entry we've got in here is TTL. TTL means time to live. And this is required if you're using advanced multicast routing, and it describes how many routers the multicast packets are allowed to go past. If you're not using advanced multicast options and you don't have a network administrator telling you to change this, just leave this on the default one. As I mentioned before, we use a convention in Synergy to understand what we want to send the multicast to to avoid colliding. We don't want to have too many things coming out with the same address. So what we do is we choose 239 always at the front, then we use the same number here that we have on the network card here. Then we use the fourth number matching the network card. And then we just take the third number here, three, and add one, two, three, four to it, depending on how many things we've got. It's just a convention we use here to prevent having to look up and maintain complex spreadsheets in our test environment. The important thing is to make sure we never reuse any address more than once, not even on the same machine because otherwise the network will send all of those down. The final part is the port number. This lets us differentiate streams. It may be that we want to download two streams with two different port numbers to differentiate them, but generally you should use different IP addresses with a different port number in all cases. We always use the default 1234 here and vary the IP port to get a unique combination. Moving down next, we have the video format options. This is where we can pick how we want this output to be rendered. I've been set to 1080p50 because this gives a really nice view on PCs decoding this. But you might want to use 1080i25 or 1080p25 if you need lower bandwidth feeds or to run into some traditional broadcast equipment that can't handle the higher frame rate definition. Similarly, you might actually want to be rendering out to SD solutions. So we have some standard definition selections here. We also have some smaller definitions, say 960 by 540 or 1280 by 720 at 25, which are useful if this stream is destined for mobile devices. We'll come back to that later. We also support UHD outputs. 
In this release, we support 25 frames per second and 30 frames per second outputs at 4K. Uh, that'll get bigger in the future. For now, we're going to stick with the 1080p50 output because it gives a great output when we look on our screens here. The next option set is how we want to compress this video. We're using the NVIDIA H264 GPU offload. It's a great choice and saves a lot of CPU power. If we don't have an NVIDIA board installed, we can use the standard Synergy software H.264 encoder or the Synergy MPEG-2 encoder. The MPEG-2 encoder is really useful if you have some legacy equipment you want to get to or you want to achieve some really low latency multiviewers, perhaps set with iframes only, to get just a few frames of delay from your multiviewer onto your screens. However, I'm going to stick with the H.264 NVIDIA encoder for this demonstration. We can also experimentally use the HSVC encoder to get really highly compressed outputs. The next thing to choose is our bitrate. At 1080p50, we've got quite a lot of frames and quite a lot of pixels. So I've chosen a 25 megabit stream with IBBBP GOP structure of 30. If you don't know what a GOP structure is, either choose the settings I've got here or go and spend some time reading on the internet about it. It's a really important technology for understanding how codecs work. But at 25 megabits and a 30 frame GOP structure, we're going to get a really good looking feed here especially using the NVIDIA GPU. Final choices are how we want to compress the audio. MPEG audio at 192 sounds great, but if we're really trying to get our compression levels down, AAC is a good choice if we need to shrink that down to really low rates. Otherwise, we can also do uncompressed audio if the receiving devices you have don't support compressed audio options or audio is really important to you to be uncompressed. Finally, when we're in H.264 mode, we have an entropy encoding mode. Really, you should just leave this on the default. Kabak is slightly more efficient than CA VLC, but at the same time, not everything supports Kabak. If you don't know what you're doing, just leave it on CA VLC. In H.264, we've disabled 420 and PATH inside NVIDIA because we don't support 422 when using the NVIDIA offload. If you have to have 422, it means you have to move back to software. And if you have to have control of the interlace, MPEG-2 is where we can configure this. Under MPEG-2, as well as having interlace control here, we can choose an adaptive GOP structure. So we can choose a GOP structure that matches what we've picked here, and then we can let that be adaptive, meaning that when the scene changes, it will adapt that for us. In H.264, we don't need to worry about any of these settings because these three elements are all automatically controlled for you. So having shown you all the settings we can choose inside the multiviewer, I'm going to reconfigure this machine now to output an IP stream from this very piece of software, and then we'll look at the results on this screen. So if we turn back to the PC, I'm going to move to MPEG-2, I'm going to pop it to a very low GOP size, so we get a low latency, just an IP2 at 50 kilobits, will be fi uh, 50 megabits, sorry, will be fine. So if I enable this now, what should happen is I hit apply, the multiviewer should restart, and we should have a nice low latency stream appear on here from the multiviewer, and it's going to draw in all the elements as it decodes those IP streams. So that lets us take the first IP stream out. So we're looking still on my PC here and second on here, but let's add a couple more because it's really good fun to add an extra stream still for other use cases. So if we go in here, nothing stops us still add another one. So we have another RTP on the list. If we enable this, label this one with something more helpful like dash, we can pre-configure a scaled down version. So I'm just going to run through some of these settings quickly. So here I'm going to pick one of the smaller things we talked about before. Because I don't actually have a functioning NVIDIA board in here, I'm just going to pick the standard Synergy one in here, and we'll use our software encoder at 2 megabits, 4 to naught. We'll set an IP coding of 30. And then we'll set a low bitrate AAC audio mode. So having done this, we should now be able to start this. And if we look at what our task manager is doing and hit apply, we should get multiviewer start back up now with multiple networks out. We'll have a slightly higher CPU load and we'll be outputting slightly more video data. So if we key in the multicast address here and then hit play, that will actually open up the much lower rate and scale down 960 by 540. It's worth using this second output because Synergy Multiviewer will actually re-render all of the elements rather than just squeeze them down. So all of the fonts and the text will actually be recomposed for 960 by 540, giving a much clearer view on any mobile devices you send this to. 
If we want to forward this onto any mobile devices, there are various solutions for doing this. One that we've used multiple times and we know works great uses the Wowser platform. That will take in that transport stream we've pre-encoded without any extra encoding, can then forward that on to a variety of mobile devices, iPhones, Android devices, iPads, web pages. We know that works, we know that works great, but it means with just one multiviewer, we can be looking on screen, on a bigger screen, and on a smaller screen, all in one go. If you want to install as a service, inside the config tool, we have the service management tab. That lets us click install and then start. This will warn me I can't do this with a windowed output, so I can choose my outputs, I can disable that on-screen output, apply that, and it disappears. I can then quit the running multiviewer and then hit start in here. That will restart as a service, and now I could log off this PC. So I could log off this PC now, and multiviewer will keep running, and you can see it's still going over my shoulder. I hope you'll join me in the next session when we'll talk about alarms, where we can use Synergy Multiviewer to raise alarms and start letting you know that you've got problems with some of the streams we're looking at.